All right, there we go. My name is Michael Mann. I want to welcome you today to worship here at the First United Methodist Church of Lombard, and we're also joined today by Calvary Church, Phillip Park. Welcome, welcome as we worship God together as one family. We're all family. We're a part of this family of God connected as United Methodists in faith, and I'm so glad that we are here today. Um, I want to let you know a couple of things. Our church is doing a whole lot of different things, and they're all in our bulletin today. Our announcements are just chock full of things that are coming up, like our back to school bash, and also we have some conversations that we are in as a church to discern where God is leading us in our future. Both of those are next Sunday after church. Um, today, after Sunday uh, worship, we're going to have a conversation time together. And we're just going to invite everybody. This is everybody can come back for a light lunch. It'll be back in the chapel. And our chapel is set up for the amount that, well, the fire code will let us. If we go over that, we've got a parlor you can spill right into. But here's the thing. When you grab a sandwich and you sit down at a table, be sure that you sit down with people that are not from the church that you were a part of or came from. Like, sit with people that you don't know and get to know them, um, because we are going to have a great time together. Now, some of the things that our church is involved in is raising funds for our apportionments and missions, and one of the fun ways that we do that is holding an auction in the springtime, and we auction items like, well, sermon topics and the hymns that you can choose for our worship time. So all of our hymns today are actually chosen as a part of that auction, and we also invite people to be a part of other fundraising activities, which is one coming up real soon. Yes, indeed. We have uh, an opportunity beyond the auction events that people are still signing up for, including our church's own Oktoberfest coming up on October 1st, fundraiser that's available to us through the Glen Glendale Heights Communities Oktoberfest, which is held over at Camera Park, uh, September 15th through September 24th. Our church and members and our friends can participate by helping serve the food at this event. People purchase the food from cashiers, bring us a simple list of what they bought, and we simply fill the order and hand it to them, tell them to make sure to get a napkin and maybe some mustard. So it's not a real challenging job. It is busier during dinner time or maybe kind of lunch hour or sat, you know, Saturday afternoon time, but it's a busy time. It's a good time. Flexible hours. We have shifts. We have sign-up sheets in the back. And uh, we, we will be working September 15th, which is a on the Fridays the 15th and 22nd from 4.30 on. Even if you can work from 6 to 8 or 4 to 8, something like that, just make a note. That's a, we, want, we need as many people as we can. The way that we make money from this is the number of hours our church members or our representatives work, the more money we make. The first year, we only... Uh, got into this at the, kind of toward the end, but we still made $1,575. Now last year we jumped on the bandwagon a little earlier and we were able to make 3910 which is not chump change. So altogether it's like $5,400 for our efforts of working a little and having some fun, but again the more shifts you can work or time you can work, the more we make. And this is based on the proceeds and, and the dollar amount that is assigned for each volunteer hour by the uh, Oktoberfest committee, which is in large part uh, Wolfgang Beyer and his wife, Alfreda, are members of our church and created this opportunity for us. Now picture it, huge tent, like three or four times bigger than this sanctuary from front to back, uh, twice as wide, and a lot of happy people, some really, really good food, music going on, everything from typical German music to uh, the Elmhurst University Jazz Band to some local high school uh, bands playing. And there's also a German shop. You can get yourself a nifty little uh, hat like this, as well as really authentic uh, German souvenirs from the, their vendors. So it's super. Those of you who work, you get a free meal and a free beverage. Think about it. It has potential. It's fun, it's easy money for our church and its ministry. So I hope you'll sign up for many hours back there and we can help haul in some free dollars. Thank you. Good 
matter where you've come from, no matter how you've gotten here today, whether you've driven, whether you've some way come and walked here, whether you've tried to walk on water and failed, still Jesus reaches out to us and lifts us up and draws us in. It is that invitation from Jesus that unites us now as we come in this time of worship. So I invite you to center yourself as we sing together victory in Jesus. with joy. Give thanks to our God. Let us proclaim God's mighty works. We rejoice in our God. God's miracles are a wonder to behold. 
Give thanks to our God. We trust in God's saving ways. We rejoice in our God. give thanks to our miraculous God who brings new life again. And please pray with me. God be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, you visit us in dreams, offering us glimpses of new possibilities. When we feel like we're sinking, you rescue us from life storms and lift us from the raging waters. Be with us now as we call on your name. Draw us together across all lines and tongues as your renewed and many-hued people. May we stand together with courage and empathy, receiving the grace you extend in Jesus Christ for us all. In his name we pray. Amen. Please join us singing in singing our hymn of praise out of the United Methodist Hymnal, Standing on the Promises 374. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. job. Hi, everybody. All right, so today I brought, all right, I brought two things here. So guys, I'm going to just stand up for a second so that everybody can see these. Um, 
Does anybody know what these are? Uh, you may have seen them in the nursery before. What are they? The connector thing. The connector thingy. So they're blocks, right? But the interesting thing about these blocks is that they're hollow, so you can put stuff inside of it. So, Maddie, do you think this one is going to, if I were to put it in water, do you think this would float or sink? Hold this and you tell me. It would float. Why do you think it'll float? Because it's circular. Okay. And it doesn't have that much weight. It doesn't have much weight, so it's going to float. Good. Hold on a second. Now, David, this is a, a big kid thing because this one is filled with water. Can you hold it? Now, David, if I put that in water, do you think it would float or sink? Sink. Why do you think it'll sink? Um, because it is heavier. Because it's heavier. Right. It's filled with water. Now, I say this today, guys. Because our story today is about Jesus walking on the water. And Jesus walks onto the water, and it's amazing. He's able to walk on the water. And Peter, his disciple, is so excited. He says, Jesus, can I come walk on the water with you? And Jesus says, of course you can. And he extends a hand, and Peter starts walking on the water. But do you know what happens? David, do you know what happens? Um, he can't walk with it. Yeah, so he gets afraid. He gets afraid and he starts to sink because he, mm, he realizes he gets all that fear and he gets scared and he lets all that doubt take over and he starts to sink. And so it kind of reminds me of these two blocks here today, guys, because this one, Amelia, can you hold on to this for me, can float because inside of it, there's not anything weighing it down. And this one reminds me of Peter because he was filled with fear and anxiety and doubt, and he let it pull him under. So what do you think we can do to get rid of that fear and doubt and anxiety? What can we do? We can be brave. We can be brave, yeah. We can let God in, and we can pray. And when we do that, watch. We can pour all that doubt and anxiety and fear out and we can fill it with prayer and we can fill it with God and we can fill it with the teachings of Jesus and that will fill us up and it'll help us to float again, right? So that's pretty cool. So everybody, can you bow your heads in prayer? Dear God in heaven, we know that sometimes the fears and the anxieties and the worries of the world, they take over and they fill us up. But God, instead of allowing the fears and doubts and anxieties to fill us up, Fill us up with your love. Fill us up with your grace. God, let us pray to you and fill us up with your light so that we may float again. God, we put all of our trust on you. We throw away our cares and anxieties and we turn them over to you because we know that you are stronger than all of us, than all of the things that drag us down and you will help us to float again. God, we thank you for this. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, as together we sing, Jesus loves us. Let's go to the nursery.
Our gospel reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 14. Let's do now pray the word of God. I've got a little break. Let's see if I can take care of that. Maybe turn this down just a smidge. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Holy Scripture, and I invite you to respond by saying, Thanks be to God. Everybody, it's uh, nice to be with you in worship and being able to come. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and come together to worship and bring glory to our God. Um, my church knows this. I'm just going to share this with you because it's just been bothering me for the past 10 minutes. Um, so, if you don't know, I'm a second career pastor, I have an engineering degree. And the reason things float isn't because they're light or heavy, it's because they displace the amount of water weight. <laughs> They displace the amount of water weight. Okay. I'm just, for me, I was like, oh, that's not right. <laughs> so now you have some insight as to what bounces around in my head before I'm supposed to come up here and preach. So it's, a, it's again, it's nice to be with you. So we have this story this morning that Pastor Michael read to us, right? And so... The story kind of connects, and I don't know if you read the two fish, five loaves story last week, but this immediately comes after that. So the entire narrative that's happening here, right, is Jesus gets news, right, the beginning, Jesus gets news that his cousin, John the baptizer, was killed. Herod has him beheaded, right, and John's disciples take care of his body and send news to Jesus that his cousin has been killed. And Jesus wants to mourn this, right? Like any of us would, that we have somebody we love that's been killed, somebody that was dear to us. And not only that, but somebody that was the herald of the kingdom of God, somebody that came before Jesus in Jesus' role. And Jesus wants to process this. So Jesus goes and tries to find some alone time. Jesus goes out into the country to be alone. But somebody sees him. Somebody from the surrounding villages sees him and says, hey, that's the dude that's been healing all these people. We need to go see them. And so what happens is Jesus is trying to have alone time, but all these people come and find him by this lake. And they bring their sick. They bring their tired. They bring their hungry. They bring all these people because they've heard that Jesus is a healer. 
And so they bring them, and Jesus sees them and has compassion on them and heals them the entire day. And finally, it gets close to the end of the day, and the disciples tell Jesus, you need to send these people off. We don't have anything to feed them. And Jesus tells them, you feed them. You only have the five loaves and the two fish. Jesus says, bring them to me, blesses them, breaks them. And what we know, right, is that at least more than 5,000 people could have been fed from that miracle. But Jesus still hasn't had his alone time. Still hasn't had it. And so where we pick up the story, if you were listening when Pastor Michael read it, the first word, immediately. So Jesus dismisses the crowd, says, okay, it's late, it's time for you to go home. Dismisses them, sends them back to their village and sets the disciples and says, you 12, get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake. Now, of course, the disciples are like, well, that doesn't make any sense. How are you going to get there? We're not going to come back and pick you up. Right? How are you going to get there? And Jesus says, don't worry about it. I got it. So you guys just go. So they head off in the boat. Jesus heads up the mountain. Jesus heads up in the mountain to pray, to spend time with God the Father, to recharge, to process what's happening. Meanwhile, the disciples are drifting on this, this lake, headed to the other side, and a wind picks up. And if you've been boating, if you've been on Lake Michigan, even Lake Geneva, you know that if the wind comes from the right direction and blows down the length of the lake, you know it can whip up some pretty big waves, right? Lake Michigan is famous for them. And so here comes the storm, this big wind, Right? This storm, and now the boat's rocking, and the waves are crashing against it, all these things. And the disciples are afraid. They're afraid. They're afraid the boat's going to swamp. They're afraid that they're going to fall in. They're afraid they're going to drown in this storm. And this goes on all night until around 4 in the morning. Now, this is dark, right? Maybe there's a moon. Maybe there's starlight, but it's dark, and I'm on the water. There's no lighthouses. There's nothing like that. It's dark. And they see a figure coming across the water toward them. And they're like, this is it. This is the angel of death. We're done. He's coming to get us. They think it's a ghost, right? And they see this, and they're, they're fearful. They're afraid. And Jesus calls out across the water and says, don't be afraid. It's me. And Peter, got to love Peter, Peter says, God, Jesus, if it's you and you call me to come, I will come out. Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on the water. Toward Jesus, right? But the wind is still blowing through his hair. His clothes are still flapping in the breeze. There's still waves there, right? And so the human part of him kicks in and goes, wait. <laughs> Looks down, feels the wind, sees the waves. He starts to get scared again, right? His faith starts to, to waver, and he starts to sink. And as he's sinking, he cries out to Jesus. Jesus comes, pulls him out. They both get into the boat, and Jesus says, how could you let your faith waver like that? How could you lose your faith like that? I don't know how many times you've heard this story in a church like this one or like this one, but you've probably heard it a bunch because I know I've heard it a bunch. And the lesson, and if you look through your bulletin and you see the readings and you look at the prayers and the things we sought about, sung about this morning, the typical lesson that we preach about here on this lesson is human faith is usually something that's kind of lacking. Right? We point to this story and we say, you know, Peter is this human character and he had faith, but he didn't have the kind of faith that would rise to the level of Jesus. Even though we strive as Jesus, as our model of our faith, 
human faith won't reach that level until we talk about how human faith isn't quite there yet and how we sink. Right? How we sink, start sinking below the water. But we always preach, but the good news is that Jesus is right beside us. Jesus is right beside us. And Jesus will reach down and pull us up and bring us into the boat. And so we take comfort in the fact that even though we're not quite up to snuff, we're not quite good enough, that we have a God that loves us that we have a God that shows mercy and grace to us, and that God is beside us at all times. And that, my friends, is a great lesson to learn from this scripture passage. Except that this, that isn't how this scripture hit me this week. That isn't how the scripture hit me this week. So I want to take a look at Peter for a moment. Now Peter, Peter plays a prominent role in much of the New Testament, right? But Peter is this human, human, human character in Scripture, right? Peter is the one who's like the, like the Mr. Every Person, or Ms. Every Person, right? Is showing the human side of reality, of what it means to be really human, right? But, you know, in much of the scripture, Peter is kind of shown as this sort of not quite there yet kind of character, right? I mean, Peter is the one, right? Jesus, I mean, this is in no particular order, just what's ever in my head here. But Peter, right, Jesus is telling the disciples about what's going to happen in Jerusalem, about his betrayal, about his torture, about his crucifixion. And Peter says, no. No, this is not going to happen. And Jesus says what? Get behind me, Satan. Peter doesn't get it right. Peter is one of the disciples. They're walking on the road, they're talk- and they're debating which one of the apostles is going to be first in the kingdom of heaven. Who's going to be on top? And Jesus has to explain, you don't get it. You're not getting it. The last will be first, and the first will be last. And then we know the story, right? We know famously, right? Peter cannot stand watch with Jesus on the night of his betrayal, and he, and he betrays Jesus three times that morning. Peter is this incredibly flawed character in the early parts of the gospel. Peter is us in some ways, right? But that isn't how it struck me this week. How it struck me this week as I was reading the scripture passage was when Jesus is walking across the water, 11 men sat in the bottom of that boat, scared, frightened, bailing out the water that was coming into the boat and did nothing. And did nothing. And here's Peter. Hey, if you call me, I will come. Peter is, by all measures, if you think about his interactions in the gospel, by all measures, okay, his enthusiasm for Jesus and the kingdom of God far outpaces, far outpaces his knowledge, far outpaces his wisdom. He's always saying the wrong thing. He's doing the wrong thing. Jesus is constantly co- kind of correcting him and growing. And yet, and yet, that's the man who Jesus will have breakfast with. Ask the questions. Do you love my people? And say, on this rock, I will found my church. Peter gets out of the boat. When all the other 11 are sitting there huddled in the bottom, worried about their lives, worrying about the boat swamping, worried about what's going to happen to them, Peter gets out of the boat. 
There is absolutely no denying that Peter is 100% Team Jesus. He is absolutely, positively committed to the kingdom of God. And his enthusiasm, his enthusiasm for that outpaces that human concern, that human control element that says, no, wait, I'll get out of the boat, but first you've got to answer some questions for me. First I want to know, like, are you guaranteeing me that I'm not going to sink or get wet? And then I want to know, is there a path back to the boat, or do I hang out there? I mean, I want all the I's dotted. I want all the T's crossed. I want the plan. I want to know, before I step out of that boat, I want to know what's going on to happen, right? That's the human element. I don't like ambiguity. I don't like the unknown. I don't like to take risk. I want to control that. I want you to sign the release of liability form before you get out of the boat. But Peter gets out of the boat. No plan, no form, no certificate, no anything, just trust in Jesus. Gets out of the boat. How does that scripture hit you? How does that scripture make you feel? So to me, at one level, the scripture is empowering. It's empowering because I recognize, and I hope you all recognize with me, that all of us, regardless of whether we wear a clergy collar or not, are all called to the work of the kingdom of God. We're all called to make the kingdom of God visible in the here and now. We're not waiting for death. We're not waiting for heaven. We're not waiting. We are called to make the kingdom of God visible here and now to our family, our friends, our community. We are called to help make God's love visible in the here and now. All of us have that call that's placed upon us. Jesus is outside the boat saying, come. So when I hear this scripture and I see Peter, part of me is like, God will take care of that. If I can get out of the boat, then God is there. God's grace, God's mercy, God's love goes with me when I get out of that boat even though I don't know the plan, even though I don't have the certificate signed, even though I don't have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. God's there. In fact, the scripture hits me enough that it's like if we as humans have to plan and draw out everything, if we have to lay out every bit of our actions and our plans, how do we leave room for God to appear if we have controlled out every single variable, every single degree of freedom? We have crushed it from a human standpoint. Where's the room for God? Where's the wonder? Where's the mystery? How does God show up? if we have taken away all of that in our planning? Where? So, in one sense, it is empowering to me to hear this scripture. On the other hand, there's a moment of shame. <laughs> there's a moment of shame because, you know what? There is a part of me at my age and where I am in life that would just be rather on the couch, watching my uh, Korean drama shows, playing Candy Crush. My congregation knows this, going to White Castle and getting sliders. That's my sin, sorry. There is inertia 
right? There is inertia that goes with the human condition. We like to be comfortable. We like to be comfortable. And yet, Jesus still is outside the boat saying, come. Come. So in the end, this passage, for, this, for me, this passage is challenging. That's my one word I just It's challenging because it presents me with a challenge. Do I get out of the boat? Do I sit in the bottom with the other 11? What do I do? And so now, I'm going to make that question your question. How do you feel about this scripture? How does it hit you? Where are you in this story? Are you Peter? Peter, Mr. Enthusiastic, but has no idea what he's doing, but is going to do it for God, knowing that God will take care of him. Or are you one of the 11, bailing the boat and not doing anything? How do you feel about this story? Where does it hit you? What does it call you to do? That is my question. That's my challenge. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with all of us as we continue to think about this. Amen. Take a moment to ponder that. I'm going to fight us to a time of prayer. I'm going to lift up prayer requests that we know of, but there are some that may not have been lifted up yet. We have prayer cards that are in the back. Pam, while you're back there, could I call on you to just lift those up? And if you would like a prayer card, if you have somebody that you would like to lift up in prayer today, could I ask you, Pam, to just walk those around? There should be little pencils in the pews if you need one, and we have several pens and pencils in the back. Just fill that out and bring that up, and uh, there'll be time while I'm lifting people up today for you to for us to mention that. Uh, I'm going to lift up those that we know of who are in need of prayer, but uh, I'm going to let Pastor Jim give our pastoral prayer today. I'd like for him to pray for us and with us today. So as we're gathering those, I, I lift up the folks who uh, we know of today. I'm going to lift up Pat Baker. Ken Schmidt, Tom Hayes, Ellen Woolitz. For Wolfgang Bayer, Wolfgang actually broke his leg a, a many weeks ago, and as they're heading into this fall with the Oktoberfest, he's still heading that up. But Wolfgang, we want you to know we pray for you and for Detard, for Lee Wright, for Brian, for the Morehouse and Donahue families. For John Klugman, a friend of the Wixons. For Bruce Abbott, Nick Myers, for Grace Stetson and her family. For Charles Knapp, Vic, we're praying for Chuck, we're praying for him today. For Alex and Nick Owens on the death of their mother, Susan Geshry. For teachers and for students, many of whom are going to be starting back into the classroom this week. If some of you know of teachers or know of students, would you just lift up a hand and just keep them in your thoughts and prayers today? Because I know that our teachers are excited about a new year, but I also know you're probably a little daunted by all that needs to get done. We want to lift you up today and uh, remember them in our time of prayer. Are there other prayer requests that we know of? I saw one up front. Anybody else? Thank you. Continued healing for Laura Rush, that is Nancy Smith's uh, sister. For Laura and for all of these that we lifted up today, as I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy. 
to our prayer for the people of Maui. Would you pray for those on, on Maui, for the many that are still dealing with the aftermath, for those that have lost loved ones' homes so much. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Amy Marzullo, uh, as you have uh, some tests done tomorrow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Jan and Ben Wakefield, uh, Jan and Ben were former youth pastors here, but Jan lost her mother this week, uh, Jan. So we pray for Jan and for Ben. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I know that there are some other unspoken requests. We continue to remember some of you that are healing. After some things this week, we celebrate uh, anniversaries with some of you, and we celebrate uh, times that are meaningful in your lives, birthdays and other times together. For all of these, I say God is good. Could we respond uh, all the time? God is good all the time. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Loving God, we come to you, we come to you as your, as your children. The children that have experienced your love, your mercy, your grace, your presence throughout our lives, even in those moments that we weren't aware of it. You were there. You were there inside the boat and outside the boat, calling us out to be your people, calling us to help make your kingdom known. And we are blessed and privileged by that call. God, we pray in those moments that we have not heard that call or not answered it, we pray for your forgiveness. And we know that you, forgive, you do forgive us and that you continue to empower us and call us to be the best people we can be and to work for your kingdom. God, you have heard in our words and in our heart this morning the ways that we have experienced life in your creation. You've heard about celebrations and birthdays and anticipation of the school year starting of weddings and new life, and all those graces that come from you and the goodness of your creation. And we are in awe, in awe when we think about our balance sheet of life, about how much goodness, about the blessings we've experienced, about the things that you have made us stewards over, of all those things, we are in awe of what you have blessed us with and what we have and the, the joys that we have experienced here this week. And we give you thanks for that, God. And in the same moments, God, we know that because this world is still broken, still distorted, that there is still suffering. There's still death. There's still illness, physical and mental. There's still suffering from war, from natural disasters. There is no shortage of things we could pray about. In all these things, God, we give this to you, not because you need a reminder, not because you don't know, but God, because this prayer, praying to you, transforms us, transforms us to recognize the ways that we are still dependent upon you, the way we still need you, to stay we, the ways we are still dependent on your grace, your mercy for our existence, for our lives, and for the strength and patience and wisdom to get through these struggles. And so God, for all those this day who need it, all those who struggle, all those who mourn, God, we pray an extra measure of your presence, your grace, and your mercy upon them. We pray all this in confidence that you hear our prayers and answer them when we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as God's people, I invite you to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I want to invite you to give as God lays on your heart today as our ushers come by with a basket. If you are like me and I don't carry cash or checks, we have a little QR code in our bulletin today. If you're online, there's maybe a link. Um, you can follow that link or follow that QR code and it will pull up the web page where you can make a donation to our church. We invite you to give today as God moves you to step out of the boat. God, our first offering is our love, loving you and others boldly, refusing to let our fear of the storms surround us and keep us from taking risks. Because you call us, we will leave our places of comfort and dare to set out foot outside the boat. Even when we sink up to our knees, we know you will be there to pull us up. For all this, we give thanks in the holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Please join us in singing our hymn of celebration out of the United Methodist Hymnal, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, 133. What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Lead me, Lord Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Lead me. Everlasting 
you would join me in this morning's benediction as we go out to be God's people. The invitation has been given. Step out of the boat. Walk where you have never walked before. And know that even when you falter, Jesus will be right there to lift you up. Go now in the name of God the Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer. Amen. Amen. We step forth boldly to share God's gifts with all we need.